Over on Jaguar Gator 7, a new baseball video is out. In this video, we talk about the time that the Royals decided to bench their best player for some reason against Randy Johnson. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. In 1968, the Miami Dolphins were an absolute train wreck of an organization. Little did the fans know that eventually, they get one of the greatest head coaches of all time in Don Shula, who would immediately turn around the team, would completely change the culture of the organization, and would give the team roughly a quarter century of stability that most organizations would kill to have. But in 1968, yeah, the Dolphins were a joke in more ways than one. Everything was wrong with the team, from its lack of talent and its inability to win games, to an inept coaching staff that seemed to focus on playing favorites with its roster management and starting lineup, to an inept management that cut a player and intended to bring them back, but never got the chance to bring them back at first, because the news about the player coming back was never communicated to that player. So the player was so upset about getting cut, that he left the team for Atlanta after hearing the news, to its absolutely terrible connection off the field with the community, where local high schools threatened to boycott the Dolphins because they were stepping on high school football's turf when it came to scheduling games. Seriously, I could make about a hundred videos about the dysfunction of the Dolphins in the AFL days. That's how bad it was. So for today, Here's one of those crazy dysfunctional mess stories that you might not know about. In week two of the 1968 AFL season, for Miami's first game of the year, the Miami Dolphins took on the Houston Oilers. And by the end of the game, all the talk wasn't about what happened on the field, but rather, what was on the field. Seriously, the feel for this game, as you're going to be able to tell very quickly, was absolutely terrible. And when I tell you the reason why the field looked like an unplayable mess that had both players and fans up in arms, you're never going to believe it. In 1982, a fan screwed over the Dolphins by messing up the field at the Snowplow game. And in 1968, a Dolphins fan screwed over everyone by messing up the field in what I'll call the phone book game. Because this is the story behind one of the craziest controversies and messes in the history of the Orange Bowl Stadium. Before I talk about the actual controversy in question, which was highly visible to anyone watching the game, we need some context to understand the importance of this game and how everything was transpiring. It's September 14, 1968. It's week two of the AFL season, and we have a battle on our hands down at the Orange Bowl on Saturday night between the Houston Oilers and the Miami Dolphins. For the Dolphins, this is their first game of the season. Four teams were on a bye for the first week of action, and they were one of them. And after not beating the Oilers once in 1967, getting swept with a 17-14 loss in Houston, and an embarrassing 41-10 loss at home to end the season, the Dolphins were looking to turn the tide in this one with what would be an incredibly symbolic win. As for the Oilers, this sort of feels like a must-win game, seeing as they lost last week to the Kansas City Chiefs, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Back in 1968, only the division winner made it to the playoffs, as there were no wild cards, so it was absolutely imperative that the Oilers did not start this season off with an 0-2 record. In the history of the AFL at this point, of the 16 teams to play in the AFL Championship, which was the only playoff game each year unless there was a two-way tie atop the division, only the 1966 Bills made it there with an 0-2 start. Even though teams like the Jets, Raiders, and Broncos hadn't even played before the night of September 14th, by this point, Houston's season, in essence, was on the line. And the good news for Houston in the solo important game was that, as you can tell from the highlights, they won playing well and winning it by a final score of 24-10, thanks in part to 21 points in the second quarter of action. They forced Miami to turn the ball over four times, while averaging close to 4.5 yards per carry on the ground on 164 yards, and while outgaining the Dolphins by nearly 100 yards, 
outgaining them 396 to 295. Plus, they forced Dolphins quarterback Bob Greasy, who was pretty solid as a rookie in 1967, all things considered, to look terrible. As Greasy went his 13 for 28, completing only 46% of his passes for 165 yards, three interceptions, and a passer rating of 37.6, which is worse than anything than nothing, but spiked the ball into the ground on every single play. Greasy also threw a pick six on one of those plays, with Ken Houston returning one of his passes in the second quarter, 66 yards to the house. All in all, it was a much needed win for the Oilers, as they silenced the Dolphin faithful, who came out on this muggy 79 degree night. But while watching these highlights, you might have noticed something about the field. And that is the simple fact that the field looks like crap. I mean, look at this run by Larry Zonka. Seriously, look at it. It looks like he's running in bird poop. There is more white on that field than there is green. That field is so white that when Three Dog Knights sang The World is White, they were specifically referring to the Orange Bowl playing surface on this day. Which raises the question, why is the field so white? Why does this field look terrible? Obviously, it's not snow. It rarely snows in Miami as it is, let alone on a September night. It's not bird poop. It's not a paint malfunction where the grounds crew didn't do its job properly, and the painted lines on the field weren't fully dry yet or something like that, leading to just splats of white paint everywhere. It wasn't poor lighting, or a concert from the night before, or just the way the broadcast came out through NBC's cameras. Rather, it had to do with a teenage hooligan and a phone book. Allow me to explain. But before I go further, we need to know that the Orange Bowl back in 1968 had massive security problems. And when I say massive problems, I truly mean massive problems. To the point where the games were just a giant free-for-all, and where being in the crowd was like being in the wild, wild west. If you were a kid, not only could you get into the game for one dollar, getting in for dirt cheap, but you didn't even need a parent to be accompanying you. This meant that on Saturday nights, for one dollar, teenagers could get into the stadium, where security was basically incompetent, and could have fun that way. And I'm sure you can see all sorts of problems that can arise from this, and from just letting a bunch of unaccompanied teenagers run wild since there were only 37 security guards on duty inside the entire stadium. And of those 37, roughly 30 of them just watched the game and don't do any security whatsoever. Meaning that you had 7 actual security guards in a stadium of 80,000 people. That's one security guard for every 11,428 people. So imagine a Miami Marlins game in 2022, and having one security guard around the entire stadium actually doing something. As one person said in a letter to the editor, of recent date, these party souls are becoming disgusted at the actions of young hooligans who threaten to take over the Orange Bowl unless an immediate police crackdown is forthcoming. Supporters of the sport have a right to enjoy the contest in a modicum of peace, even though the comforts fall short of those offered in newer stadia. And truly, these hooligans weren't there to watch a football game. They were there to cause as much trouble as possible and to just have a good time on a Saturday night. Among the things that happened during the preseason alone, to which the Dolphins responded by doing nothing, the teenagers would bring sticks into the stadium, mob the concession workers, then beat them up and rob the concession stands of their money. There were teenagers spitting on fans as they walked in the tunnel, or throwing water on the fans. And in the most extreme cases, since this is 1968 that we're talking about down here in the South, you had all-out race wars, where white and black kids would fight and would instigate violence against each other. Genuinely, there are some newspaper articles and blurbs that I found that I cannot even show in this video because the language is that bad. I think you can see where that's going. Honestly, when you hear the stories about the Orange Bowl back in the AFL days, it's genuinely kind of amazing that, at least to my knowledge, 
No one died in a Dolphins game back then. Seriously, you had race wars and people somehow being allowed to bring sticks into the venue. And you had no security at all. As Jim McDonald, one of the workers at the stadium, said on the security at the venue, our guards speak to at least 100 kids in each game about throwing water and spitting on people. We're in a rough position. If we put our hands on the kids, the crowd is invariably on the side of the kids. We get booed by the crowd, and you're dealing with a touchy situation. We're dealing with some of the worst young punks imaginable. I wonder if people in the stands realize how bad it is. We have no problems with the kids who come to the games with their parents. It's the ones who have been turned loose for the evening on their own. And again, despite these problems, and despite some obvious solutions, such as hiring more security, or requiring photo IDs to get into the game if you're unaccompanied, or by not allowing people to bring in items like sticks, the Dolphins in the Orange Bowl did nothing whatsoever. Which brings us back to the question of the hour. How on earth did the field end up looking this ugly? How did it end up looking like this ugly, ugly mess? Well, one teenager decided that he was going to bring multiple phone books into the venue, as one does when attending a football game. I know for me personally, anytime I go to a Jaguars game, I always make sure to have my wallet on me, as well as my ticket, my phone, my jacket depending on the forecast, and five phone books, just in case I need them for some reason. Even if there was a logical reason to bring a phone book to a game and inside the physical stadium itself, like you might get drunk and you won't recall off the top of your head the number that you need to call to come pick you up, or a friend wants you to call them at the game for some reason, and again, I'm not sure why you would bring a phone book since you could write down those numbers beforehand, but besides that, there's no reason you need multiple phone books in your hand. It's like having two plungers for one toilet, or having two identical copies of the same movie. It's completely redundant and pointless. But somehow, not only was the teenager bringing the phone books into the venue, but because security was completely incompetent, they didn't stop him and say that he couldn't do that, or question him for one moment. They just let him walk right in with multiple phone books in his possession. Now, why do you think this kid brought multiple phone books into the Orange Bowl? Do you think it was because he wanted to sell them on the black market? Or give them to one of his friends? Or to someone in his section? Do you think he was a Die Hard Dolphin fan, but had a big phone book memorization competition coming up? So he had to study at the game? Of course not. He wanted to cause trouble. And thus, taking the phone books while sitting in the northeast upper deck of the stadium, he ripped them up, ripping up the pieces of paper of the phone books, and then threw the paper on the field, letting the wind take it wherever it may. Seriously, it was that simple. And amazingly enough, no one on the field cleaned it up, even though it was clearly impeding the game and was hurting the players and their ability to move around since not only did you have to dodge members of the other team, but you had to dodge pieces of paper and the uneven surface from that. And double amazingly enough, not one security guard was able to identify the man who did this. You would think this would be pretty easy. You see where the paper is coming from. You see the chunks of paper flying. And then, you see what fan has a phone book in his hand. Not that hard. But again, Security was so bad that the teenager who did this got away with it scot-free. Said one fan, the condition of the field of the Orange Bowl was a disgrace. One entire corner of the field was covered with litter thrown from a corner of the stands. Where were the police, stadium officials, or the parents of the children? Surely we're not going to be subjected to that litter every game. Oh, and for those wondering just how much paper this is, the reports say that it was several phone books that were torn up. In 1968, the Miami phone book, which contained 18,000 more listings than the 1967 edition and 350,000 listings total, was 875 pages long. Several phone books, each at 875 pages, 
Yeah, you can do the math on that one. We're talking somewhere in the ballpark of 2,500 pages being torn up and thrown onto the field. With no one, not a single soul, working in security, catching who did it. Seriously, I don't even know what to say to that. Safe to say, the 1968 season for the Dolphins got off to a rough start in more ways than one. Because on opening night, not only were they beat badly by the Oilers, but they were beat by a phone book too. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.